We are now at the uh, last panel of the day before we're going to have our breakout sessions. And I feel like we're coming um, to a topic that is both near and dear to my heart and really represents sort of um, a future conversation and effort that we need to be working on as a community, which is patient-generated health data and integrating patient-generated health data into the health records and into the health dialogue. We've talked a lot about access to information and how Blue Button can help support access to patient information by patients and their caregivers. Um, we've also talked just now about making sure that access is available through um, the infrastructure and broadband. And um, what really I think is the next step is moving from a healthcare system where communicating where we are communicating to patients to a one where, to a healthcare system where we're communicating with patients and where patients are part of the conversation and this is a dialogue a bi-directional communication of information between patients um, their caregivers and their clinicians the entire team so with that I am going to introduce Claudia Williams, um, who I've been working with for many years, even before she was at ONC. Um, Claudia is now a senior advisor on health innovation and technology at the White House Office of Science and Technology Pro Policy. Before that, she led ONC's state health information exchange program strategy and came to ONC before that um, from the Markle Foundation, where she was the director of health policy and public affairs. At Markle, she helped direct the Markle Connecting for Health effort. Please join me in welcoming Claudia Williams. Hey, everyone. I know we have limited time, but I'm actually going to ask you to stand up for two seconds and stretch because it's been a long haul. And while I do that, uh, could my amazing panelists please come up to the stage and take a seat? I'm going to take the chair right here. Uh, but anyway, stretch a little and sit down, because this is going to be awesome. Uh, so we have come a long way to now be in this beautiful, amazing room. I do love the Great Hall at HHS, but this is a little more guilty and fancy than we've had in the past. This is amazing. So um, I did the math last night and double-checked it, because it seemed quite amazing. So the average American has three visits a year with a doctor each of which lasting, it doesn't feel like it, feels like last, but 20 minutes. That's 60 minutes a year. So 99.99% of the average American's time, you are keeping healthy, you are staying healthy, you are taking care of yourself outside of the office. So most of life and most of health happens outside the doctor's office. Yet for too long we've treated the office as the place where decisions get made, where information is gathered, and where stuff happens. But stuff is happening elsewhere. So what we really want to talk about here today is how do we bring that rich experience, the observations, the data, the insights, the decisions that are happening in life into the conversation with the clinician? And even how do we put control and decision making more directly into patients' hands through the data they're tracking and their interactions with their clinicians in life, 99.99% of the time. So this is going to be a great panel. I want to introduce them. All the way to the left, we have, I'm just going to use first names, quick introductions, Janet, who is a cardiologist and also the director of the Million Hearts Initiative at HHS. Next, we have Ariel, who is U.S. A marketing manager for Withings. I never know if it's Withings or Withings. With, Withings. Withings. Next, we have Nuando, who is the mother of two and a pediatrician at the Chalk Children's Hospital. And last, we have Mike Evans, who's the director of the Ambulatory Clinical Pharmacy Programs at Geisinger. So join me in wishing them a warm welcome. And then I'm going to go on over here. So, hi, everyone from this seat now. Um, so I just want to talk, so fabulous to have all of you here. Um, Nuando, I want to start with you. Uh, you're here really to talk about your experience as a mom and the mom of a child who needed you very much, um, who was born two months early. Can you talk a little bit about the experience you're, you had tracking her growth after she was born 
and what worked and what didn't work about that. Talk a little bit about that whole kind of innovation experience you got to participate in. Um, I'm Wando Eze, and uh, as you mentioned kindly, I'm a pediatrician at Chalk Children's, and I'm also uh, a neonatal perinatal fellow at Harbor UCLA. And the reason I mention that is because, as you mentioned, I had a daughter who was born two and a half months early, so she was in the neonatal ICU for two and a half months. And so towards the end of my course there with her, I was approached by a team who was working on um, a study comparing patients who had access to an app that would um, allow them to enter data uh, about their babies as they had been discharged that could be av made available to their pediatricians after discharge. And uh, they were randomized to uh, parents who didn't have the app and then parents who were given a smartphone and had this app. And they would track data like the baby's weight, uh, the baby's mood, uh, diapers, all of this stuff that is very important to us as pediatricians, especially as doctors who receive these, you know, we call them NICU graduates, uh, babies who have spent a very long time in the neonatal ICU, and they come out with a lot of chronic diseases. And uh, being able to manage them in an outpatient setting can be very daunting uh, to to pediatricians who sometimes have to see 30 to 40 patients a day. And then you get this NICU graduate with not a lot of data. And so um, I was randomized to the group who got the smartphone, and I entered data about, you know, how much you, I, they gave us a scale. I'd weigh her every day and enter the data. And um, there were different components of the app. I'll just talk about what was helpful and I thought what could have been uh, changed. What was helpful was the weight because not just as a pediatrician, I know that's important to little babies who are growing, but just as a mom who had lived in the NICU for two and a half months, I knew that if your baby was growing in the NICU, that was the most important thing. Without any other problems, that's the most important thing. So the weight, uh, being able to convey that was very helpful. And also um, a lot of the different uh, appointments that the babies had to go to. My daughter had a moderately complex course in the NICU, so... Um, she had at least four or five follow-up appointments that she had to attend to in addition to her pediatrician's appointments. And so being able to record those appointments and what was discussed there in the app and being able to convey that to my pediatrician was very helpful. Um, even for me, as a medical professional, I, you would imagine, oh, she's a doctor, she can <laughs> manage all this data. And I actually found that it, was, it can be quite complex, you know, without having all the struggles of, you know, if you had social struggles or setbacks or travel problems, um, just being able to manage all the different appointments and all the different recommendations and conveying this to your primary care pediatrician who has the responsibilities of negotiating all these different appointments and keeping track of it and everything can be pretty daunting. So that was the most helpful part of it. And then uh, other areas that I felt like the app tried to collect data on that I don't know that was so helpful was, you know, collecting data about the baby's moods. You're not supposed to record if she was fussy or she was not. Um, I, I understand what the goal was, you know, trying to get ahead. Okay, why is she fussy? Is she more fussy now? Is it because of meals and so forth? But that data... Uh, being translated into a, an electronic format, I don't know that would be so helpful to a pediatrician because baby can be fussy for many, many different reasons. And so for me as a general pediatrician, if mom said to me, uh, my baby is not acting right, that's a red flag for pediatricians. <laughs> they don't have to say very much more. Um, and so we, as pediatricians, I don't feel like we need the computer to tell us, baby's fussy, baby's not. If mom tells my baby's not acting right, you know, we, we jump on that and we go, you know, we go through with it, we follow through with it. So th that was my general experience, you know, with, mm. with the app from, you know, a mom perspective and, you know, pedi pediatrician's perspective. One of the things um, I know some of you know our friend Erin Moore, and she describes the experience of actually tracking her son has cystic fibrosis, and she arrived at the emergency room. They said, he needs IV antibiotics. She said, no, he doesn't. This is not what an event looks like for him. He has a cold. And she actually pulled up his data, and she said, look at his baseline. Here it is. Here's the track. 
and no, he does. It took her 24 hours, but she finally convinced them that her hunch, represented by her data, was correct. And I think what we all hope is that in some amount of time, that will not be an argument. That will be a normal thing to bring the data forward. Even if they didn't give you an app, you just did it on your own. And, and Janet, that brings us to you. And I think you bring this amazing experience of sort of thinking about global change in an incredibly important area of cardiac health and having been a clinician. And I think you have incredible insights about how we actually need to change our clinical care model. What's it gonna look like? What needs to happen? What needs to shift? And kind of how we're gonna get there? Thanks, Claudia. And thanks to ONC for the chance to participate uh, today and get to hear uh, the other uh, panelists. Um, Claudia is talking about something called Million Hearts, and the initiative is a five-year initiative to prevent a million heart attacks and strokes in that five-year period. And one of the key contributors to fewer heart attacks and strokes would be blood pressure control. Claudia knows I can get on a soapbox about this, but right now in the country, one in three of us adults has high blood pressure, and the chances that it's controlled is about 50-50. 50-50 chance of actually being safely controlled. And one big contributor to that poor control is that we're using a model that's a terrible model for a dynamic variable like blood pressure, which varies moment to moment. We bring someone into an artificial medical setting, usually take one reading, maybe two, and then the patient and the healthcare professional try to make a decision about treatment based on two random, not random, two data points obtained in a non-baseline setting. Now, really. That's not very good decision making. So when um, I was approached about an opportunity to listen to experts in patient-generated data, blood pressure control jumps to mind because the change that Claudia mentions is the transference of the locus of control for blood pressure, no pun intended, from the medical person to the individual whose blood pressure is elevated. Um, so that they use their healthcare professional as a coach or a consultant, but they actually have the skills they need, they have the technology they need, and most importantly, they have an active channel to and from their treating provider. So the data and the advice can flow back and forth. And, of course, that has to be wrapped in a business model that supports that over time. Great. And, and to just paint a little picture of what that could look like for blood pressure in particular. So, like, what data? Obviously, it's blood pressure, but how does that get tracked? How does the data get shared? Right. What kinds of decisions get made? How does the communication occur? Yeah, uh, I listened to the previous panel. Wonderful uh, insights there, and one of them that I kept hearing in different forms was, "Let's make sure these data are actionable." W one of my earliest thoughts is that we need to uh, have some sort of central web site so that all of us can text our blood pressures up to this place somewhere. We always think about the cloud, right? Uh, text our blood pressures up there, and then um, once a blood pressure or two um, exceeds a certain set of parameters, a trigger goes off and the treating provider is notifi notified. I spent more than two decades as one of those treating providers, and if I started getting every blood pressure that my patients chose to send to the cloud, not only I would freak out, but every, what, everyone in my office, right? Everybody would go running out. So what you want are actionable data. So that going to the cloud business could work if we had algorithms that said X percentage of blood pressure readings falling outside these parameters, then a trigger goes off. Great. And Rondo, I want to go back to you for a minute. Um, as, now, as a physician, how did that experience affect how you doctor? And, and whether you might even ask some of your patients to do more tracking at home or I, most of the moms I knew actually did a lot of tracking at home, or invite that data into your practice? Um, I think because I have the experience of being a general pediatrician and also uh, being in training to be a neonatologist, um, I think the whole experience changed what my expectations were from parents. I think it's easy for doctors to say, Make sure you go to this appointment and this appointment and this appointment. And, this, and by the way, uh, make sure you keep track of this and this and this and this and this. And sometimes I feel like we don't make sure that our patients have the tools that they really need to be successful in taking care of themselves and their children. And so, I mean, it's given me a complete 360 
uh, view of um, how I approach patients in terms of, you know, when I send them out of the NICU now, I don't just say, make sure you do this and this and this and this. I say, you know, what resources do you have? How can we help you do this? How can, and I, um, and this is why I feel that uh, uh, patient access to information and information technology is, you know, incredible in terms of being able to give patients empowerment, as we discussed earlier, but also the tools to help them be more successful. And and I just want to reiterate what um, she said and what was said on the panel before, um, is that the information, like we've said, the data is coming. And mm -hmm. it's got to be hashed out in a way that is beneficial to uh, the providers and the patients and their families. And just, you know, to developers as they're thinking about, you know, creating effective ways of uh, compiling all of this data, whether it be through mobile devices or other platforms, please uh, keep in mind to kind of make it a collaborative effort. A good health for children is really a collaborative effort between mm -hmm. the provider and, you know, the parents and the children. And, and for them to really please to keep that in mind, um, because it doesn't help for the parent, uh, the patients to have all this data and not know um, what to do with it, or the provider to have all the data as well, but not have the information, uh, especially, social infor especially social information about the patient that can help them be more successful. Great, thanks. So Ariel, in, we had a prep call, and she said something that was, I think, right on, which is the observation that patients are there. Right, not every single patient, but the pay. I talked. I had a session last week with a guy who has created something called D Data Databetes. Right, Databetes. He's basically tracked every single possible sensor trackable thing for his type one diabetics over the course of a year, and developed hypotheses and tested them with his data. One of his hypotheses is that eating out was unhealthy for him, which it, which he proved. Another was that running a marathon would be good, and. You know, he literally had a chart this big with these amazingly beautiful graphics. But patients are there. So what you said in the call was, we needed this yesterday. And I, I'm, I was interested to hear that part of your business strategy isn't just putting out awesome tools and equipment into the world, but is actually trying to help us with the culture shift and the society shift we need to go through to get to the place we all want to get. Can you talk a little bit about that? What needs to happen, and what are you guys doing to make that happen? Yeah, absolutely. So for those of you that are unaware, Withings um, creates connected health devices and applications. So that ranges from um, a smart sleep system to our wireless scale, blood pressure monitor activity trackers, and, and all the data that um, the consumers use go up into the cloud. And, and really what we're trying to do is give people these tools, um, as you, know, you heard from previous two panelists, that you know, these are the tools that people need, um, and not only help them track, but really improve their health. So yeah, I mean, I, I think what's interesting is I've observed over the past year is that my company has already come out with six new devices in this mobile health field um, within the year, and it takes so much time for healthcare and medicine to catch up. And I know that the model we have right now isn't perfect. The company started as a only consumer facing product. And now that, you know, I'm out here talking to people like you and speaking to a lot of medical professionals to try and improve upon the current solution that we have. And we're actually running a number of pilot programs, one with um, the American Medical Group Association, where, you know, focusing on blood pressure specifically, um, they have a campaign called Measure Up, Pressure Down. And we're working with four medical groups across the country to um, address you know, the patient-physician relationship with using these tools at home outside of the regular doctor's visits. And I think with this, we'll be able to come to some kind of conclusion as to where it stands with sending blood pressure measurements that patients would take every single day with these home monitors, and then the measurements that they're getting for that one once-a-year visit with their clinician and, you know, finding the perspective from the position 
um, fr from the physician and from the patient as to you know where we can really make that caregiver model um, work best. Great. Mike, you've been um, engaged in some exciting pilots at Geisinger as well, in particular focused on MedRec. And we all know how important it is, and often challenging, surprisingly, to have an accurate view of what patients um, are, what meds they're taking. And waiting till a patient's in the office with their bag of meds may not be the best way to do that. Um, or especially if they don't have the bag of meds with them. <laughs> I don't know, it's the blue pill. So I've done that before. Um, so talk a little bit about your pilot and what you're learning and the approach you're taking. And kind of, again, like, Jan, this is such a big intractable problem, improving blood pressure control, and talk about the potential safety benefits as well as of what you're doing. Sure. So uh, in Geisinger, we have pharmacists based as clinical experts inside the family practice and specialty clinics. So they're not distributing pharmacists, they're clinical pharmacists seeing patients and in population health. And an important aspect that we've noticed this for quite some time is patient adherence to medications, chronic medications, is about 50% of the time. So if you can imagine, if we're trying to control a chronic disease and the patient's not taking their blood pressure medicine, we're going to control their hypertension about 50% of the time. What we also noticed is medication lists. So meeting meaningful use, we're completing med rec 99.9% .9 of the time in the system. But an internal study of the med rec is even though it's completed close to 100% of the time, it's actually accurate less than 50% of the time. Mm. All right. Not a surprise, anyone in the room, I'm sure. So our postulate was back in before 2010 was can a patient accurately give us a medication reconciliation? And we wanted to do this outside of the office visit because, as we know, and as Claudia brought up, we have 20 minutes in the office visit. So we wanted to see if a patient in the comfort of their own home, whatever time they wanted to take, could complete a medication reconciliation. So we, com we developed our own survey. Um, it was a grant from ONC working with NORC, and we used a patient portal, we used a separate software, pushing a questionnaire that was home developed out to the patient prior to an office visit. And again, we, the idea here was to make sure the medication reconciliation was up to date prior to the office visit. That way then, if the patient was coming in, we could address their chronic disease that wasn't under control based off of adherence. One of the postulates, again, also was, can the elderly do this accurately? And surprisingly, yes. The elderly are very tech savvy. Can and how long will they do it? So we'll, if they're on 25 or 30 medications, and yes, these patients are on 25 and 30 medications, will they take the time to complete the survey accurately at home? Yes, they will. But then, what do we do with the information? So the previous panel brought up a great question is, now we're generating data. What do we do with it? All right. So you heard me say that I have pharmacists, clinical pharmacists, based in these primary care and specialty clinics, acting as mid-level providers, working collaboratively with primary care physicians and specialists. So we have medications that we're having issues with. Who better of a person to take care of a medication issue than a pharmacist, a clinical pharmacist practicing collaboratively? So if the patient has an issue with a prescribed medication, it's pushed to the pharmacists that are in the clinic. If they have an issue with an OTC or an herbal product, we're pushing that to the nurses in the clinic. Again, we're doing this outside of an office visit. That way, when the patient comes in for their appointment, their medication list is up to date. The pilot occurred back in 2010 and 2011. We're pushing this across the health system now, finding out that it increases now efficiency in the clinic. So when a patient comes in for that 20-minute appointment, we've already done or completed the medication reconciliation prior to. So now the nurse who's rooming the patient doesn't have to take that 10, 15, sometimes 20 minutes to do a med rec. And it's also accurate. So we're looking at the med rec after the appointment now saying, is it complete? Is it accurate? But most importantly, back to Janet, is now the patient understands why they're taking the medication. They're going to be adherent to the medication. We're not going to have polypharmacy because we're adding another medication at the office. Is it when really it was adherence that was the issue? So there's been many contributing factors and downstream effects from the process. Um, so I'm excited. Uh, thanks again to ONC for inviting here, and we're continuing to push forward in that, that field. Multiple others. We started with med rec, but we're also looking at asthma, hypertension, Bluetooth, um, and multiple other issues uh, for patients, and finding out that we can actually take care of the patient better when they're at home than when they're in the office visit. So right. thank you. So um, we talk interoperability is a big word for today, and I think 
as we're talking about additional data streams and additional types of data, additional health IT platforms, the question becomes, how does this all come together? What do these devices all need to actually literally interface with the EHR? Do we need a new kind of data aggregation model? What are the standards we need? Um, and, and to some extent, I think some of these technical problems get solved when you address the cultural problems and the business problems. So we have to be a little careful that we don't try to drive solutions that will actually, to some extent, work themselves out if we can get those other things right. But also interoperability, as the congressman said, can be both a driver, right? It can also help drive forward progress if we can solve problems that uh, allow for lots of other use cases and availability. So I'd just love your thoughts, each of you from your own perspective. What is the thing we really should be focusing on from an interoperability standpoint? We don't want to boil the ocean. What is the thing over the next year that you'd love to see happen in your space? Um, whether that's simply that the, those data are more usable by the doc or that they're syncing up with the EHR. And we'll start with Mike. So thanks, Claudia. Um, multiple issues, um, and I'm not even sure where to start because it's an open can of worms as we're, as we're here. But um, I think, and the last group brought it up, is, again, payers. So payers have to be willing to look at different ways to reimburse clinicians mm -hmm. as we're interacting with these patients. Um, as we develop these new delivery systems for healthcare, right now the payer system hasn't caught up with it. So that's a barrier, mm -hmm. so the payer has to catch up. Number two is, is where is the information going to flow back to? So Ariel talked about the cloud. So does it come back mm. to the cloud, depending on the algorithm, then where does it go? So um, and the last group talked about it also, the clinical experts helping with the decision making with the information experts to develop the right formula, the right platform. Great, thanks. I completely agree uh, with his thoughts on the issue as well. And um, uh, coming from the perspective of a provider, um, I would like to see um, platforms that allow uh, me to uh, share information that I have with my patient to improve their care and the care of their family and their children. Um, from a parent perspective, um, I would like to be able to access that data, but also be in the context of being able to com uh, communicate with my physician. Um, I think I would hate to see as a byproduct of, you know, you know, improved access to data for patients to have there be a loss in the doctor-patient relationship. Mm -hmm. I feel like, uh, you know, this access to data for patients and providers should accentuate that relationship. Um, and it, 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 in many cases, it could even be dangerous. Like, for example, if a patient were to you know, be in high risk behavior and be exposed to HIV and um, get an HIV test. If they have access to the results before they have time to talk to a provider and get resources, that might not be in the best interest of the patient um, in terms of their missing that doctor patient relationship uh, to be able to have access to resources and information about what can help them through this process and so forth. And that's just one of many, many different examples of where. Um, I feel like it's really, really critical and important that there is this component of it's a team effort. All the parties need to be on the table. All the stakeholders need to be involved to make sure that there's not this um, unintentional byproduct that could uh, be problematic uh, in the future. Thanks. Hurry up. So yeah, I, I mean, Mike made a really good point about um, the petter side and for us, I mean, it would be in an ideal world the best situation if we're able to eventually have um, these devices be reimbursed by insurance companies. And I think the challenging piece is, is being able to show that what we're, what we're doing from the prevention side um, actually you know, gives a, a very strong ROI on the healthcare side. And so that's something that you know, we need to work towards getting at. Um, and another point I just wanna make is, you know, with the announcement from Apple last week with HealthKit, a lot of people have been asking now to, to companies like Withings and, and similar companies, 
you know, what, what are going to be the challenges now? Is, is this going to be obsolete, this whole market? Is Apple going to take over? And I think really for us, it's, it's making it more mainstream. We were originally just small companies in a very early adopter marketplace and mobile health and M health, that, that's all still very new. But I think that Apple um, will help to make this more mainstream. And that, that's really the goal that we're trying to get at. Great. So I agree with all the excellent points that have been made. And when I, I would only add to it um, this idea of geography and that I travel a lot of places and most of the time, thank goodness, I'm not in a physician's office. Um, and so if I'm thinking about blood pressure or any other thing I want to register with my healthcare professional, I want to be able to send that in from wherever I am. Um, it's particularly dear to my heart about blood pressures because I may have them checked in, at a, a church or I might have it at a beauty shop or I might uh, have it checked in a grocery store or a pharmacy. And I'd love to be able to know that those are going to go where I want them to go. But ideally, I want them in a pattern by the time they get there. Mm -hmm. Because I think this is about improving the quality of decision making. This multiple data coming from the patients, it helps us as patients know whether we trust the diagnosis. Do I really believe I have high blood pressure? I know because I know what brings mine up and I bring it down because I'm monitoring it. And if my healthcare provider also has that, I think he or she's going to make a better decision too. Great. I want to, um, I think uh, Don Berwick uses very effectively a uh, way to build a movement, a way to build momentum which is to paint a picture in data or paint a picture in words of the future you want. So I want to ask each of the panelists to write yourself, write us a postcard from two years from now. And what is it you'll be, you know, at the beach having fun, right? What, what is it you'll be saying about what we've accomplished together and how data are informing care? And I would ask you to do it in less than a minute. So what's the picture postcard you're going to write back to us in two years? And then... It's up to all of us to make that happen. This probably takes some thought. Janet's going first. OK, so it's December, let's say January of 2017. Million Hearts curtain has fallen in December of 2016. And what I'm beginning to see is a tick downward in heart attacks and strokes over and above the trend we've seen for 30 years. But that is because the nation's blood pressure has come under control. Wow. <laughs> So for me, it would be about education, and we recently just did a survey about what the American public knows about their vital signs, and it's really low. People just don't know about what vital signs are being taken at their physician, physician's office. And so in two years from now, it's about everyone knowing what those numbers are and being in control of it. Uh, for me, it's, uh, I believe the health of a nation starts at the child level, which is one of the reasons I'm a pediatrician. And so in two years from now, it would be heavenly if we would have some sort of a platform, whether it be um, the blue button or some sort of a platform that really empowers parents to empower their children uh, to work closely in a, in a collaborative effort with uh, developers and providers to have some sort of way that we can improve health uh, healthcare outcomes for children uh, with the resources that we have in IT. So from a pharmacist's perspective, medication adherence. So if we can get patients to be adherent to their medications, we'll have Janet's hypertension under control. And we'll also have also the other chronic diseases under control. So using health information technology, push and pull from the patient uh, to increase medication adherence. Uh, if we see that by 2016, it would be fantastic. <laughs> so let's make it happen. And let's give a, round of a warm round of applause to the panel. Thanks a lot.